Hello and welcome to another Football to the Max, and uh, we hope uh, you have enjoyed all of our previews so far that we've done. We did all of the AFC, now we're officially moving over to the NFC, and guys, I mean, this weekend, you get the first preseason game, how are you, are you excited? Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm excited just because it's finally football uh, to well, actually on the field, not just, you know, conversations about, you know, uh, mishaps or drug situations or uh, guys not signing contracts, guys signing contracts that were amazingly large. Uh, it's just we actually get to see it on the field. That's what I'm thrilled about. And so it's going to be a lot of fun. I'm really curious, you know. Uh, because, you know, there's going to be, I believe, the Packers and the Colts. So two teams that, I, you know, I don't get to see on this kind of scale when it comes to Hall of Fame games and things like that. Usually see other teams, but it's going to be kind of fun. It's going to be neat. Boys, you do realize now we do not have another Sunday without football until February. Life is good. Yes, beautiful. Well, and then by now with the preseason, you get like almost a game almost every day. Yep. So, you know, we'll get to actually awesome. talk about stuff that's on the field for this next month. So we'll have to, I don't know, we'll have to maybe do a little bit of a special or something for one of the days that we do these of uh, just talking about what we've seen on the field for the week or something. Oh, definitely. Um, so if you see a special extra football to the max, you'll know what that's all about. But, uh yeah, so let's not waste too much time. We did have, we do have a one, uh, we have a couple of players that signed some ridiculous contracts, including a Navarro Bowman, which we'll get to hear from of the 49ers uh, guy talking in, in just a little bit. But we're going to start here with the Seattle Seahawks and last word on sports writer for the Seahawks, Carly Sibbert, uh, giving us the lowdown on what's going on in Seattle over there. Hello, and I am here with Carly Sibbert of LastWordOnSports.com. She writes for the Seattle Seahawks. How are you doing today, Carly? I'm good. How are you? Doing okay. Just trying to, you know, get through the day, you know. Yeah. So... You know, the Seahawks, they continue to, I mean, the defense continues to be kind of what it is, but there's, you know, questions uh, with who they've lost and, like, kind of big parts of the team. How do you feel about what happened in the offseason with with the Seahawks? You know, the Seahawks lost mostly a lot of uh, notable people on offense. And in the draft, they were able to add a lot of depth. And right now with the training camp, they're really working on with the offensive line. They, um, they right now, they lost, so they lost Russell Alcoon and Alvin Bailey and J.R. Sweezy. And they're really taking first team reps right now with Gary Gilliam at left tackle and Mark Lewinsky at left guard. There's Justin Britt at center and German Isetti at right guard. Jarmarcus Webb at right tackle. And Gilliam and Britt are really both having to adjust to these changes. And 
it's not the only thing that they're having trouble with. So we all know that on Super Bowl, Marshall Lynch retired. So Seahawks had to go to the draft and grab some guys to be able to take his place. And last season, we saw Thomas Rawls, and he really had a great start until he broke his foot. So that's one of the stressful situations of them trying to find a replacement for him. And in the draft, they drafted C.J. Procise, Zach Brooks, Alex Collins. And they said that in training camp, those guys have been showing real potential to battle against Thomas Rawls for that starting job. But a couple of them had have minor in, injuries like C.J. and Zach and Alex just Nothing major, usually a week, but that's always concerning to see for when the season starts. And they're always worried, of course, Jimmy Graham. We saw him get injured last year. And they have Luke Wilson and Cooper Helfett, even though Cooper had to have surgery recently for his injuries. And they got Brandon Cotta to take his place. People were concerned that Jimmy's injury, he might not be able to come back from it. Possibly he won't be ready for the season or that it could be career-ending because injury to the patellar tendon is hard <clears throat> excuse me, it's hard to come back from. But Pete Carroll assures that Jimmy should be ready, along with Thomas Rawls, to come back for the season, although they are currently on the physically unable to perform list for training camp. Huh, I mean, that's uh that's pretty scary to hear about Jimmy Graham after they make all that big money to sign him and everything and Exactly, yeah. Uh the big trade, yeah. I mean he was starting to sort of get Joe with uh, Russell Wilson later at, in the season. He was he was starting to become more part of the offense. Do you think that, let's say he is healthy, we're going to see him use a lot more than last year? Absolutely. I think we'll be able to, if he's healthy enough to play, I think he will be a much more useful um, target for Russell Wilson because, you know, joining a new team is never easy and you've got to adjust to the offense and learn the new plays and the system. And we saw Jimmy struggle at first when he joined the Seahawks. And so if he comes back, I think he will have a better, much better season and be back to his old self like he was when he was with the Saints. I mean, they did lose uh, some big pieces on defense and a Bruce Irvin and Brandon Meevane. I mean, it's kind of hard to just outright replace those guys, but how are they sort of covering for that? Yeah, they, they definitely lost those guys. And I think they're working really hard. Cliff Averill, we all know him, he says the pass rush is looking really good right now, and that's always good to hear. Seahawks defense, you know, they've been really known for being, you know, there's the Legion of Boom, and they've been the top one of the top defenses, if not the top one in the NFL. And so really in training camp, they're really working out these guys to see who can come out first, and they're really building a team. And, you know, Pete Carroll and John Schneider, they've really been known to build these teams, especially out of the draft, um, like average guys, you know, in college, they didn't really make a huge name for themselves, but Pete and John um, draft these guys into these big positions, you know, and in the second round, the Seahawks were able to get uh, Jaron Reed out of Alabama, and he's showing good promise. So it's, it's always kind of stressful going into the season when you don't know a whole lot, but they're looking like they can really get the defense and offense together. I mean, Pete Carroll did get a big extension uh, yeah. as well for coming into the season. I mean, just what he's been able to do with his team, take it from sort of being nothing to perennial, basically always you can, you know, they're going to either go far in the playoffs or win the Super Bowl or something in between. I mean, does this help the players know that you're going to have this coach around for a while more? I think that is definitely helps the players, like, assure them. You know, the Seahawks are always looking for another Super Bowl, and when they brought Pete in a couple years ago, they've only missed one playoff year with him as the head coach. And so, you know, the Seahawks lost one Super Bowl in, uh, about 10 years ago. Then they were able to win one. Then they went back to back, but they lost. So we're really hoping with Pete Carroll, especially the John Schneider um, extension, that they will try. They will definitely go for a playoff run. I think it's a pretty good chance that they'll be able to do that under Pete. And just having the assurance and the consistency of head coach and stuff. You see many teams who are 
firing their coach every two years or so, and they're still struggling with a losing record. It definitely works for the Seahawks to have Pete for at least five years, maybe ten. Yeah, I, I just gotta be careful. I don't get fired for uh, you know Mr. Kovacs. Might get mad. We just talked about Pete Carroll. Day, so. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh, I mean the obviously this division uh, with I mean Arizona just being yeah. as good as they've been. And you've mm-hmm. got the, the sort of unknown with the Rams and the 49ers are kind of what they are. I mean, what do you see with, let's say how the Seahawks were last year. How do you see them with, with fitting with this division here? You know, it's it's a good division. It's, you know, head-to-head rivals between all the teams. And Arizona have shown themselves to be a pretty good threat. You know, they were number one last year, and sadly they lost in the playoffs. And the Rams, are, you know, they're good too, but they haven't really shown to be a huge threat. And especially with this move to Los Angeles, it can make them vulnerable among the division. And we've seen the 49ers struggle especially, but they've got new head coach Chip Kelly, and he could start to make a difference under their team. You know, um, people say that Colin Kaepernick could thrive under Chip Kelly's offense. So the Seahawks are, you know, I think they're looking at some tough competition this year among their division, but I still think they remain at the top. Yeah, so you think that they, uh, they're they beating out the Cardinals this year then for sure? I think it's definitely a possibility, but there is an unknown there because the Cardinals are very good, and, you know, there's always a heated competition when they play at each other's home fields, you know, sometimes the Seahawks will win it there. Sometimes Arizona will win here in Seattle. It's, it's, it's hard to say, but it's really going to, I think it'll come down to the last thing to see who comes in as number one. Uh, so you were talking about the offensive line, I guess, kind of being a work in progress right now. Is there a worry there for Russell Wilson he already had problems last year with the line, the way it was of basically yeah. having to escape so much. Mm-hmm. You think that's going to be an issue for them again this year? You know, I think Pete Carroll and all the other coaches are feeling pretty confident in their offensive line. They're making adjustments to positions, especially with Gary Gilliam and Justin Britt. They've both switched positions to make room for some of the rookies and other additions. And, Russell, um, last year he had a high in sacks of 45 for throughout his career. And, you know, he was running from these defenders on nearly every play. And, you know, it's stressful in that situation. But the Seahawks remain optimistic about what their line's doing and how they're looking in camp and that they can protect Russell when he's on the run or even in the pocket. And, you know, it's a concern also for the running backs. You know, you need good protection for them to be able to make these plays. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you, they need uh, not just to protect w- Russell Wilson, but they got to be there for Thomas Rawls or whoever else is going to be running the ball. Exactly. Uh, yeah. For them, I mean, so <clears throat> what do you think? Looking at the team, looking at the division, saying, "Okay, this is realistically, I think, best case scenario for the Seahawks is." Oh, but I think they definitely have a chance of getting to, I mean, it's nearly guaranteed to me that they will make it to the playoffs. So I think that gives them a real shot at the Super Bowl. And, you know, considering their um, upcoming schedule for the regular season, I think they have a good chance of getting maybe 12-4 is considering all the, especially with the division, you know, there's two matches with these teams. So 12-4 and four or, you know, 11-5 and five, like the record last year seems – like their best case scenario that they can get because you, they're always, you know, they got games against the Patriots in Arizona at home and they're getting Carolina here in Seattle and Carolina beat them here last, last year. And it's like, it's, it's a tough situation, but I think they can make it definitely have a winning record. So are you willing to make that, uh, that prediction of they're making it to the Super Bowl or. I think they've got a great chance. Yeah. What do you think is the worst case for them, like the worst you see them doing? Uh, you know, they've been a really good team for the past couple of years, especially under Pete Carroll. So um, I think they can – it'd be a surprise, I think, if the Seahawks just missed the playoffs. That would be a big surprise. But if 
it's possible if the Rams are able to come back up and even the 49ers under Chip Kelly, if they're able to come back up, it's going to give Seattle a tough road to be able to make it back. But it's it's really tough. I, I don't know what it's a possibility what the record could be. Hopefully it's a winning record. I think it's a long shot if they can will make it under eight and eight. Well, Carly, uh, got to make uh, the tough prediction here. What do you think are going to be the final standings for the division when we're oh, at the boy. season's end? You know, uh, I think the Seahawks will come out on top. We're following with Arizona and the Rams and the 49ers. It just, it considering their the past couple of years of how they've played, especially with building the roster in the off season, I think the Seahawks can come out on top. All right, Carly, you've answered all of our questions here. So I want to say thank you for helping us out. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Oh, no problem. Uh, you are uh, welcome back anytime. If we're, I know uh, I know who to go to for my uh, if I need uh, some some help with the Seahawks. Right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right. That was Carly Sivert for Last Run on Sports uh, Seahawks writer. Guys, I mean, and you'll hear it from some of the other guys, uh, some of the other uh, uh, guys that we have here talking about the other teams. There seems to be this thought that perhaps the Seahawks are not the same Seahawks and we might see them kind of go on a downtrend. Welcome to uh, parody in the NFL, which is what they want. I mean, this is what I've been saying is going to happen for many years. Is, listen, Seattle's been on a ridiculous run. I, I don't think they're going to fall off a cliff by any means, but you can see changes in Seattle. Now the question is, will they do what New England has been able to do and find pieces and make things work? Can Russell Wilson be the Tom Brady of the NFC and and continue to make you know a decent roster look legit, like legit Super Bowl contenders each and every year? Pete Carroll, I, I think, is that kind of a coach. It's just, can they continue to do it? The problem is they are in a division, to me, that is a lot tougher than what New England has to go through. And you look at New England where the Jets, Bills, and Dolphins who have continued to stumble over each other to try to reach their level. In the NFC West, you have a team in Arizona who I think right now is better than Seattle and has continued to show that not only are they at the same level, they might be a step above already. So I, Seattle can't just maintain like New England can. And I think you could hear from her and, like you said, probably from some of these other people that it, you can start to see some cracks. I definitely agree. And, you know, we look at a team like Seattle that's had so much success. And I think that, you know, when you have success like that, a lot of times you've got a lot of pieces that are transitioning out and – other ones transitioning in. And I think a lot of times also there's a comfort zone that gets affected uh, mm -hmm. because coaches, uh, general managers, everybody involved, players included, get really comfortable about being good players, good team. And then they start missing out on the little things, the things that actually matter. And that affects teams. And we see a year in and year out. I mean, how many times, you know, Randy just talked about parity. That's part of this parody. How many times do we see really good teams end up being really bad teams overnight? Mm -hmm. And you're just like, this is almost the same roster. What happened? You know, things just happen that way. So I'm not, you know, in, in the mode of wanting to throw away this team at all and say that they're going to be 8-8 eight and eight or something like that. No, I think they're going to be a good team. I think they're still going to be solid. They're just not going to be dominant. They're not going to be a team that's going to walk in on game day and people are automatically going to pick them to win. It's going to be, you know, a little bit more even playing field uh, for them most of this year. Yeah, and Sean, in that interview, you guys brought it up, so I'll, I'll ask you this question. I, I think the biggest misstep that they had lately was the Jimmy Graham trade, and it really affected them last year before the injury. And I am curious. I mean, she seems very hopeful that, you know, he will start to get into that, that system. I'm curious if it's possible. Jimmy Graham is not somebody who blocks. That's not 
in his MO. He is a pass catcher, and you could tell his frustration when he wasn't getting the ball, and you could tell the struggle that Russell Wilson went through as he was getting sacked left and right because he lost not only a great uh, pass blocker, and I'm blanking on the offensive lineman that they, they traded. Uh, Unger? Is it his, uh... Un- yeah. yeah. Or Akun? No. No, Akun uh, was the one that went to Denver. Yeah. 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 Uh, Unger sounds right. Uh, but they lost the offensive lineman that was definitely a great talent, and they brought in a tight end who couldn't block. So, so Sean, is it a matter of Jimmy Graham figuring out the system, or did they just mess up on this trade? I don't know. I mean, you got you did see Jimmy Graham kind of connect with uh, Russell Wilson towards the latter half of that run, and that's sort of what I think you're going to hope that continues on with this with Seattle. I think you can. You have a whole offseason now of being able to figure out, okay, where does he fit in this offense and where uh, do we put him best so that we can get him the ball more. Um, yeah, he doesn't block, but we've seen this more often. Now you have this tight end that all he does is to go out there, catch passes. Mm-hmm. And I think it can always be an asset for your team to have a Jimmy Graham. Just Russell Wilson's got to figure out how to find him. That's the thing, though. You know, I, I look at you know some of the good defenses that you know Seattle is going to be playing, and you know it's going to be hard, really hard for you know them to cover up the fact that you're not having that extra pass blocker, and for the fact that you know when they face really good safeties, you're not going to have Jimmy Graham dominating again. You know, so you're going to lose a big piece of your offense, and I don't know if this team is up for. Finding other ways. They have in the past, but this is the ones we keep talking about, not the same team. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's going to be something uh, just in that offensive line, too. Are they going to be able to click and and mess with each other and with all the all they've lost? Is, is it going to be the same thing with Russell Wilson where he's going to be running around with guys in his face all the time? You know, that's, mm-hmm. that's going to be another thing because – he took what she said, forty-five sacks last year. Mm-hmm. Could he take even more? And you know, then they don't get. That. I mean, let's not let's not forget they were a field goal away from not even making it past the first round. So uh, not even a field goal, a, a, a chippy. <laughs> Poor yeah. Blair Walsh still is probably feeling the old extra point. You know, yeah. Just, so I mean, it's uh, it's going to be interesting with Seattle to see what's going to be going on with them. But we have to move on to a team that's been a perennial contender to the team that looks like they're going to be at the bottom of this division. Uh, the San Francisco 49ers, of course, uh, Chet Yoder, who's been on the podcast before from 103.7, the game. Uh, he does stuff for, you know, the New Orleans Saints and everything in New Orleans, but he used to cover San Francisco uh, as well. And so he lends... Uh, his voice and his thoughts on the 49ers here. Hello, and I am here with Chet Yoder from 103.7 The Game in Lafayette, Louisiana. Of course, he covers the New Orleans Saints and other things there in in New Orleans, but uh, lifelong uh, uh, San Francisco 49ers fan. used to cover stuff for the 49ers uh, Mm-hmm. Back in those doldrum days, uh, <laughs> if you want to call it that. So, uh, how are you doing today? I'm doing good. Have it yourself. Doing all right. Uh, so, I mean, the 49ers now, Chip Kelly, the coach, mm-hmm. and off season, they kind of just retained a lot of the same players that they had, especially a. Big four-year extension given to Navarro Bowman just seemingly overnight. Uh, do you like what they did off-season-wise, just not going after a bunch of names and just kind of keeping their core together? Well, I mean, they they were going to take care of Navarro Bowman. That that was it. Felt like it was overnight, Ryan, but it was definitely in the process. They were they just kept working and working and working at it, and boom, they get the four-year deal. He's one of the leaders on the on the defense. Um, on the offensive side, they, they did retain everybody they could. Um, I, I, I thought their off season was 
very boring, to be honest. I, I, I thought they would have been a little more active, but given their situation and given how poor this team played last year and all the turmoil with, with Jim Topsula and everything that was coming out with guys quitting and guys retiring and all the, I guess you could say, bad apples uh, that were kind of spoiling throughout the clubhouse and organization kind of prevented them from getting any, any kind of big names, and they lost a big name. I mean, Anquan Bolden, he goes to Detroit. He's going to be solid with Megatron. And now you have a thin, uh, wide receiving core um, offensively, and a lot of question marks really surround this 49ers team. They didn't have a bad draft. Um, they drafted DeForest Buckner um, from Oregon with their with their best pick. They they reached and gave up a lot to get Joshua Garnett from Stanford, a guy in the backyard, a guy they were looking at for the longest time, and that Chip Kelly knows from his time in the Pac-12. But uh, this team just kind of kind of looks a bit stagnant and very unsure of themselves. A lot of young blood on the team. I don't know if it was a great off season. It, it surely wasn't the worst off season, but it was nowhere near a good one. I mean, talk about the uh, yeah. I mean, speak. You know, you can kind of say that I mean, they kind of just went for some positions just to kind of cover. It seemed like in the draft <laughs> after you take uh, DeForest Buckner and a, and a Garnett. Uh, do you like the Jeff Driscoll pick at quarterback, seeming, seeing as your quarterback situation is sort of still up in the air? Well, it was funny because Jeff Driscoll was a very interesting find. I mean, he was one of the top high school prospects coming out, and then you know he got drafted by uh, he got picked up by you know signed on with Florida, and then you know obviously things didn't work out there. And then he goes to Louisiana Tech, had a uh, great, you know, had a pretty good year uh, for the Bulldogs and a good run with them. Um, he's a smart quarterback. You know, it, it's hard to kind of say it's a bad pickup. It's late. You needed a quarterback. And I, I think it's a pretty good pickup. I, you know, I, I saw the guy firsthand here um, when he played the Raging Cajuns, where, where I'm at in Lafayette, Louisiana. So um, it's not bad. Um, the 49ers have a hard time right now deciding who their quarterback's going to be. I mean, Colin Kaepernick was on the verge of being traded to the Denver Broncos. There was a lot of disagreement between Kaepernick and Chip Kelly and the whole organization. A lot of former teammates uh, left the 49ers saying a lot of bad things about Kaepernick, how he's not a teammate guy, he's all about himself. And if you look at Kaepernick from the exterior point of view, you would probably believe those guys like Michael Crabtree and Frank Gore. Um, Kaepernick has has his issues, and he's definitely struggled the last couple of years. And Blaine Gabbert and Kaepernick now right now have a healthy competition, and it is neck to neck, folks. It's not exactly Kaepernick's job right now, and they're both getting an equal amount of reps right now uh, in camp. So the starting quarterback position is up in the air, uh, and that's not good for any team. You, you want to nail down that position um and the 49ers just don't have that nailed down and chip kelly has not given us any clues really on who he's leaning toward you know there's 50 percent that would say gabber's probably going to get the job and then there's 50 percent that say well kaepernick fits chip kelly's scheme so uh, i don't know what to think right now yeah i was gonna say i mean it seemed like you know in the earlier camps and everything the team was sort of behind blaine gabbard as the starter and you know especially with all the worries about kaepernick and his weight and all that has he been able to get that down and look more like the colin kaepernick of old or? he looks be- he looks better and he's talking a lot better and he's definitely been a more um i guess sold with chip kelly now and i don't know if he's just saying that or now he's just trying to play the part, but he's definitely looked a lot more fit. He he doesn't look like the freakish build we saw, you know, the last, you know, when he first broke out in the league and throughout these last, you know, three, four years. But Blaine Gabbert was picked, I guess, in July to be the starting guy, or June, they were saying, to be the starting guy. And then all of a sudden, the Kaepernick trade rumors all went aside, and now Kaepernick's in the race. And if you ask me, 
who would be the better fit? It would be Kaepernick. I mean, he, he's got the build. He's got the legs. He's got everything you want out of a Chip Kelly-style quarterback. But Blaine Gabbert's definitely got the you know more experience in the league and probably a little more smarter on the field. And you gotta be you got to have the head in the right place as much as the athleticism. So these two are, are kind of neck to neck and they're, they're taking it in, in very gracefully. They're good friends. There's no, there's no hostile, you know, environment between those two. Um, obviously they want to beat out one another and competition only makes you better, but um, it's neck to neck. They're taking equal reps right now. And Chip Kelly is really unsure of himself and, Thank goodness there's four preseason games because uh, they're going to need every bit of that preseason to see who gets the job. Yeah, I mean, uh, the help that whoever the quarterback is going to be is very young, uh, you know, with a Carlos Hyde, Sean Drawn tandem with the running backs, and you got a very, you got Torrey Smith being sort of the lead guy, mm-hmm. whether Jerome Simpson and just, uh, you know, Quentin Patton who kind of came, came on last season. I mean, do you really feel like Chip Kelly's office is going to work with all these these kind of guys that are just having to, to learn everything? Yeah, they're I guess they're leaning on Torrey Smith and and Vance McDonald, who's going to be their starting court, starting tight end, to really kind of uh, gel in this new offensive scheme. Right now, Ryan, to be honest, or Sean, uh, forgive me, uh, Sean, I don't um, I don't expect great things to come out of this offense. I think. It's going to be a learning experience, and when I say learning experience, I mean wins are not even going to be something 49er fans should be thinking about right now. They should be thinking about getting this offense back on the right track after being the worst offense last year. So uh, they got Bruce Ellington out there. Like you said, Quentin Patton, Torrey Smith. They're going to try you know, DeAndre White. It, it's just not exactly um, built for uh, – a promising season. Carlos Hyde's going to be great at running back. I expect nothing short um, from him. And they got a good stable of running backs uh, below him too. So, you know, it, it's going to be a learning experience. And when I say learning experience, we all know what that means. That means it's probably going to be about a five, six win season, just like last year. And hopefully they can just get their wheels right back on track. So, uh, the, I mean, the defense is obviously the, stronger part of the team especially you know with the divorce Buckner and then kind of everybody else that they've been able to keep a- around for the 49ers but one of your biggest pieces he's gonna be out for the first four games in Aaron Lynch I mean how's yep. that gonna affect the 49ers uh, it's gonna affect him big I mean he's on the outside linebacker core and I mean with Navarro Bowman and then they're gonna go with Will Hoyt um who doesn't have you know the best experience at that position? It, your secondary is strong with Tremaine Brock, Bethea, Eric Reed, and, and Kenneth Acker. Your line is going to get better, obviously, with DeForest Buckner. Glenn Dorsey uh, was banged up in the off season. He should be good to go um, by regular season. The defense will look better. Um, Aaron Lynch feels absolutely terrible that he's got to miss uh, four games due to the. the the um, substance abuse policy, but I mean, it's, it's not good. I mean, you're going to, you're going to miss your outside linebacker core uh, linebacker and him. And can the Niners defense survive with that loss? Yes. Um, are they going to win games because of it? Because of it? Probably not. And that, that's the thing. I mean, with, with the 49ers, you're not expecting nine, 10 wins. You're not expecting this flourishing season unless, you know, lightning strikes in a bottle. I mean, I don't expect that much. And their their schedule is one of the toughest in the league. They're at home against the Rams, and then they go on the road uh, to Carolina and Seattle. And that's, I mean, that's just two losses right out of the bag, right out of that. So uh, their defense should be better than than their offense, but uh, that's not saying a whole lot. I mean, now looking into this division, which has – uh, at least two teams that are going to be very, very hard to face for anyone, let alone the 49ers. Then you got the uh, the Rams that are freshly moved and new quarterback and everything. How do you see the 49ers with this division, and what do you think of the division overall? Well, 
the 49ers are, are probably going to be um, battling it out with the Seattle Seahawks um, to avoid last place in the NFC West. That's probably what's going to happen. It'll probably come down to the Rams and the Cardinals, and I see the Cardinals winning this division. I mean, they have – they got the best team. They got the best defense. Uh, I drafted Carson Palmer in my fantasy leagues. People thought I was stupid. Um, I grabbed him about fourth, fifth round, uh, Sean, and, and it was the best pickup. I and mean, he single-handedly won me a fantasy football league just by himself. And you got Fitzgerald. You got Michael Floyd. You got Ellington behind him. And then that defense with Patrick Peterson, Tyrone Matthew, uh, there, everything is stacked for them. Um, defensively and offensively to win the NFC West, I would say handily. I don't think I think the Rams are probably their biggest threat. But remember the Rams, they got a new quarterback. I mean they're going with Jared Goff from Cal. They do got Todd Gurley who had a good year. Um Tavon Austin who's fantastic. Um I thought their defense was going to be um better last year. I thought it was okay at times, but um I think they're only going to get better now because they're still a little bit young. But the Rams definitely uh, you know, washed their hands off from from you know Sam Bradford and all these guys, um, and now they got a legit quarterback in Jared Goff. But remember, this is a first year quarterback. I don't know if he's going to come out there and start wowing people right away. I still see the Rams winning eight nine games, maybe coming close, uh, or at least the closest team to be contending uh, with the with the Arizona Cardinals. And then you got the Seahawks who really have a banged up line, Sean. I mean they you know, they gave up Unger to get Jimmy Graham and Graham was a huge disappointment. And that offensive line is suspect. They can't if they can't give Russell Wilson time back there, he's not going to do well. I mean they got Baldwin, they got Purse. Uh, they're gonna have Rawls behind him. There's no Marshawn Lynch. So uh, you know a lot of a lot of holes in that Seahawks squad. They're still great defensively, obviously, with uh, Richard Sherman, who's just ready to play at any time. Uh, Cam Chancellor, Earl Thomas. I mean, obviously, that secondary is so good, and the line is fantastic uh, with Bennett Rubin. Um, I see the Seahawks obviously being, you know, there. Um, they'll probably, they might come close to the Rams. I think the 49ers will probably be in last place in the NFC West, and I hate to say that, but, I mean, that's just the truth. I'm not – usually I'm excited to watch 49ers football this year. I'm, I'm just kind of waiting for it. I can I can honestly wait at this point and just try to figure out who their, who their starting quarterback is going to be and, uh, and then see what Chip Kelly has to uh, provide for this offense. Yeah, I mean, it, I mean, it's really hard. To say, I mean, we're going to have to do our standings after all these interviews are done. I mean, it's even looking yeah. at their schedule, it's so hard to see where the wins are going to come because they have a really hard schedule too. I mean, yeah, I mean, and for the 49ers, I mean, maybe they come out strong in Week One on Monday Night Football. They got it at home. I don't know how they got a primetime game, Sean. You did, that happened I last don't know year too. They, remember they played the Vikings. They, Yes, and they beat them, and they played well. They played very well. Kaepernick was good, and their defense was fantastic. Maybe they come up and win that game um, because the Rams are still kind of trying to figure out their quarterback, and, and Jerry Goff's going to be you know, the starting guy, and that's, that's a lot to learn from. But then they go at Carolina, at Seattle, and they're at home against Dallas, and then at home against Arizona. So, I mean, look at those four games. I don't see a win in those four games. I just don't. I mean, it – I just don't. I mean, they'll, they'll, I mean, Arizona, Dallas is much better. They got Des Bryant and, and Tony Romo back, so they're going to be obviously contending in the East and for the NFC uh, conference. Arizona is one of the best in the league. Um, <laughs> it's going to be tough. I mean, I, like you said, if you want me to look down the schedule and try to find wins, I think maybe one against the Rams. I don't think they're going to beat Miami. Um, they're not going to go to Chicago and win that game. Um, yeah. I see maybe three, four wins. Maybe oh, they'll beat Tampa. I think I, well, they have a chance against Tampa, um, but uh, it, it's going to be a tough stretch for this 49ers team. Get used to a long season, and uh, you know, hopefully, a promising uh, 2017 season. <laughs> <laughs> so, I hate to say that. I know I'm, I'm, I'm killing everybody. I don't want to kill the vibe. The 49ers fans listening at home, but. 
I mean, that's just the truth. This team's just not going to be good. I mean, so give me a, pretty much what you gave me there. Worst. Is there a best case scenario out there for the 49ers? For the 49ers? I mean, best case, they scratch out maybe six wins. And Kaepernick decides to get his head out of his behind and and play play well in Chip Kelly's system. And if he can do that, then he can be a better quarterback, maybe attract more pieces next off season, get some get a better cast around him, some more protection on the offensive line, and they can have a better 2017 season. Maybe make a run at a playoff spot. I, I, I mean, I would like to say that they I just I don't see a playoff I don't see a playoff spot for this football team this year and I don't think any 49ers fan 49ers fan in their right mind is going to see that either I mean it's just they got a brutal schedule I mean they got New England this year they go at Buffalo they're at Miami at Chicago at Atlanta I mean are you kidding me they're not winning those games I mean right. it's just it's one of the most brutal schedules, and I'm surprised they got dealt this brutal schedule. I, mean, I don't know why. It just kind of boggles my mind. But a couple of primetime games, I, I guess that's something to look forward to. They got a Thursday night against Arizona. That's that's not going to be favorable for them. Um, but you, you got to make sure Kaepernick's head is in the right place and that he can excel in Chip Kelly's system if he's the starting quarterback. If it's Blaine, then you got a placeholder. And then you're thinking about who you're going to draft in next year's uh, draft because he, he's not going to be the guy for the long-term plan. And then that's that. Their defense will get better. I think fans will be excited about their defense once Lynch comes back. And offensively, I mean, you're going to see some new guys. You're going to see more time, like you said, for Quentin Patton, Ellington, a lot of these new guys, Burbridge from uh, from Michigan State, who they drafted a new wide receiver. It, it, this is going to be a learning experience, you know, and I, I hate to say that, but that's what it's going to be. Yeah, very true. It's, I mean, it's hard to really say, you know, a lot for them because they, they've got so many challenges, but, you know, who knows? I mean, sometimes we've seen these, these teams win games that on paper, it looks like they're not going to win. And, you know, the other team just plays badly that game and who knows? Well, that's the thing, and 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 I remember when Jim Harbaugh, you know, in his first year, he had to fix Alex Smith, and he did, and all of a sudden he took his team to the NFC Championship, where I told everybody there was no expectations for that team. I was I was covering the 49ers in that in Jim Harbaugh's first year, and I said, let Jim Harbaugh come in here and just at least build this team for success down the line. And what does he do? He he wins in every year. Uh, with the 49ers, except obviously his last year there, which was a turmoil year. So can that happen? Sure. Is Chip Kelly capable of that? Sure. But Chip Kelly's got less pieces of talent than Jim Harbaugh had back uh, when he came in in 2011. So, uh, you know, I, I, it's it, is Kaepernick, does Kaepernick have the potential of being a, a good quarterback again? Absolutely. I, I think it's still there. Do I still think right now he's the, one of the dumbest quarterbacks in the league? Absolutely. <laughs> and so <laughs> I, I just, I, it's just tough for me to buy into a team that, that has had so much turmoil, lost so much talent, lacks the depth, has a new coach that has his own issues, um, whatever they may be. And Philadelphia Eagles players are still talking about Chip Kelly. I don't know why but they need to stop because they got to worry about their own coach and their own, their own team. But eh, it'll be interesting. I'm, I'm excited about Chip Kelly's dynamic offense. And I think that's what fans need to be excited about is what he will bring to the table and what we can look forward to. All right, Chet. Well, you've answered all our questions here. So, all right. I want to say thank you for helping us out. Absolutely. I'm glad to come on. I hope I can hope we can do this again. Yeah, sure. I mean, during the season, we're hoping to have uh, you guys on more to talk about certain games and stuff like that. So, Absolutely. Uh, I'm free anytime you need me. Yeah, we need to get we'll, – we'll, uh, 
you know, with that NXT takeover coming up, we got to get you on <laughs> on that show as well. <laughs> yeah, Samoa Joe and Nakamura. I mean, do I need anything else besides that, those two in the ring? No, I, <laughs> no, I think you do. <laughs> Oh, it's going to be a lot of fun, and the way Samoa Joe's running his mouth these days, it's just uh, it'll be it'll be very entertaining. It'll be one of the best matches I've seen um, since probably Sami Zayn and and Nakamura or Nakamura and Finn Balor. I mean, Nakamura is never short of of giving us an entertaining match. So. Oh yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah. All right. That was uh, Chet Yoder talking to Cisco 49ers and giving you some, some wrestling stuff there at the end, too. Uh, I mean, there's there's not a whole lot to say about the 49ers here. I mean, we kind of know where they're going to be uh, come season's end. Uh, with Navarro Bowman, they get a nice four-year extension, though. So... Yeah, and they uh, get, uh, what is it, Anthony Davis back, I believe, or uh, one yeah, of their players from last year. Yeah. So, I mean, they, they've got some additions, and they've got some things going for them. What are they going to be at the end of the year? I mean, is Super Bowl two? Oh, I'm sorry. That's the opposite way. Uh, <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, no, I mean, I, I really don't know uh, how to take this team. I don't think they're going to do exceptionally well. Um, I don't think the high expectations are too high. Um, but I do think they're a scrappy bunch. And I think they're a team that, you know, they're they're hoping people are going to sleep on them. And they're going to be some teams that it's going to be a surprise. But for the most part, I think we all know this is the team in the division that I think has got the most growth to really figure out and, and settle into. Yeah, hey, I'm, just, I'm just happy this guy didn't retire halfway through your interview with him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I was I was worried about that for a little bit. Like, oh man, is he gonna do like a lot of the other uh, 49ers players and just see that? Uh, it's, it's, not, it's a breath of fresh air having somebody on here that knows exactly where his team sits and it has no problem saying it. And listen, it's gonna be a year or two for now. He's hoping the wait isn't super long but he knows this year is kind of just a waste right now so i mean that's just kind of how it is you kind of basically you go into this year as a 49er fan going record doesn't matter i'm watching these young players and i want to see who develops and who's going to be our future uh so in the end i think whether they finish 1 and 15 or 5 and 11 or somehow finish 8 and 8 at that point who cares it's just I want to see people develop. I want to see them try new things. I want them to experiment at this point because playoffs is a long shot and Super Bowl is a pipe dream. So, I mean, it is Chip Kelly. And the thing is with Chip Kelly's offense, we kind of already saw it in Philadelphia. So, I mean, I, the if Kaepernick does wind up being – either either if Gabbard or Kaepernick wind up being the guy, uh, they do run – so it's something that he didn't necessarily have with Bradford or whatever. I mean, Gary, is is there a possibility that maybe there's a dynamic with this team and maybe knowing that you only have Carlos Hyde, you can't really mix it up so much with that running game either of saying, okay, let's take what didn't work in Philadelphia and not do that here and and see if maybe we can rack up wins we, we weren't supposed to get. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely think so. And, you know, I, I think that they can do as much as they want to when it comes to figuring out things because, uh, let's be honest, I think they know, we know, it's it's going to be a tough road ahead. So what you do is you improvise with things that you want to try. This is the time when your team can do pretty much anything they want to do because they're in the place of rebuilding, uh, figuring out things. And so do it. Do it on the field live. I mean, when you're in a, a situation that they are, make your entire season like preseason. Try all the things that didn't work previously. Uh, try all the things that you think work. You know, Try everything into the sun until you figure out a formula that works best for your team, your players. And then you really get a gauge on what pieces you need and maybe something that's special. Maybe you find something really special that's going to aid your team years to come. Um, it's not like they're going to win a Super Bowl, like Randy said, you know. 
Yeah. When in doubt, listen to Shia LaBeouf. Just do it. <laughs> A national hero right there, Shia LaBeouf. I mean, I did, you know, think that the there was an interesting thing that he said that Chip Kelly seems unsure of himself and that he's going to need all four of these games to really find out which one of these guys is going to be his quarterback, let alone some of these guys on the team. I mean, is that something on Chip Kelly more than than the players that that Chip Kelly doesn't seem to to know what who's going to be his starter? No, I mean that's I think that is a college mindset that Chip Kelly has where he really does look at it as an open competition and at this point he doesn't know who's going to be a starter uh which is something we're not used to. With the NFL, usually the quarterback is that one stable position. But with Chip Kelly, nothing is, is stable. Everything is a competition. Whoever can prove to me that they can run my system the way that I like it, they get the job. No questions asked. So it, it's different, and I, I still think most people just can't get their, get their head around it. But I don't mind it, especially in a system that's so messed up as the 49ers right now. Why not make it a competition? Take the name off the back of the jersey. Whoever go out there and perform for me, let's do it. Whether it's Gabbard or Kaepernick or whoever. And I hope that they don't get afraid to switch these guys out. I'm not saying jank them after a game. I'm saying give them four games uh, and see what they can do. And if it's just not working out, put the next guy in. Give him four games. And if he's starting to get something, then run with it or don't run with it. I, I just think... Really, honestly, this could be their entire year. It could be a preseason, and that's okay. You know, I think it's completely fine. I know it's not good for the fans, but trust me, fans, if you find hidden gems by doing this, you're going to be thrilled. Yeah, that's that's very true. Uh, you know, there's always a plus in that, in that you can find players that you aren't really – you can, uh, like you guys were saying, pretty much you can experiment here. But uh, – all right. I think, you know, we know what the 49ers are going to be, and uh, we probably talked more about them than we probably thought we were going to. So we go on with the longest interview we have. Uh, y'all might remember Andrew Kulik, the only guy that we actually, he talked so long with us, we actually had to mess up or change our order uh, so that he could have his time to shine at the end of, of the podcast. Uh, not quite as long interview as that one. But he still gives you some cool thoughts on, you know, him being a season ticket holder for the Rams, uh, some of the things that you get to do as a season ticket holder, uh, what all that means, the process he had to go through, which seemed like a, a lot of stuff that the, these uh, these guys had to go through uh, to get the season tickets, and just um, then of course talking about the team and everything. So oh, I, I remember. Didn't we talk to him before they got moved? Yes, it was before they got uh. moved. Yeah. So, okay. this uh, should be interesting now that they have moved and everything. But all right, here we go. Hello, and I am here with Andrew Kulik. He is a Los Angeles Rams season ticket holder. How are you doing today? Terrific. Uh, looking forward to the season. Yeah, I mean, training camp has already started. I think I I saw pictures of you're out there doing the, the fan stuff. I mean, how is it, like, what are some of the, the things that you get as a Rams uh, season ticket holder? Well, as a season ticket holder, um, you get the season tickets, but you also, there's a fan fest coming up this uh, Saturday where I think all of the season ticket holders are invited for free, and it'll be at the Coliseum and they'll have a scrimmage. And, uh, you know, you can you, you get a lot of, like, the draft party. There was a huge draft party. All the season ticket holders got invited to that. Uh, it was outside uh, and stage. I mean, it was, must have been 10,000, more than 20,000 people there. I mean, it was huge. It was just the biggest party I've ever seen. Um, you know, as it goes, I guess this is, the amenities will come. Um, but you also get invitations to a lot of RAM events, and uh, you know whether you can attend up to your schedule or whether you can afford to pay. That's up to your schedule as well, up to your pocketbook. I mean, I remember last time you 
you we had talked, you were sort of in that phase of you had, I think, reserved uh, the ability to get tickets or whatever, but did you get the sort of seating area that you wanted? What happened was that um, they decided to do these things in phases depending on your time stamp of when you put your deposit in, and it was down to a millisecond. And uh, the Rams contacted me so I could avoid the time stamp because my time stamp was 10.31 a.m. and it started at 10. And they asked me where I wanted to sit. And I said I want to sit where my father sat. And I got my tickets. So I was covered and very, very pleased. My understanding is they covered tickets through waves. Every 10 minutes they used, they, they called it a wave. The first 15 minutes was divided in five waves or three waves and then every 10 minutes and they got everyone up to I think like 6 o'clock p.m. that day and after that it was there were no more season tickets to be sold and they sold 70,000 season tickets. Wow. So they sold them all on that first day. That's uh, that's pretty amazing. Uh, I mean, you said you were at the draft party and everything. How did you, what did you think of the draft? Did you like the decision with, with Jared Goff? Well, like I said the last time, I, I wasn't surprised. Um, so, you know, it was between Wentz and Goff. I think most people had settled in here in Los Angeles to be in Goff. So once that happened, my attitude is, why am I staying here any longer? <laughs> <laughs> You got no more draft picks, <laughs> right? Yeah. So you know, uh, they, you know, people were real excited when they were announcing it, and um, you know, it was on this huge screen, and everyone could see. And you had a chance to meet players. Players came out on stage, and then went into the crowd, and pictures that you could take with cheerleaders and uh, personnel, and all that stuff like that. So that was exciting. The food line was really long, so that was kind of an impossibility. You arrived there early so you could get closer to the stage, um, but it was just so many people were there. It was like by the time I got there, I walked up to the stage, and then I left, and it came, and it was just too filled up to even get close. So I kind of watched the whole event through the uh, through the uh, video monitors thing that they had, the TV, huge TV screen. One of those uh, took up like the whole side of something just so big it was in front of the microsoft theater I think oh wow they call it and um it was all cordoned off and you had to have a, a special invitation and you brought your invitation in and it was something they sent you and uh you know it had one of those barcodes and all that so then you took mm-hmm. the barcode you got stamped through and then you went in so and there were a lot of like players there old players and, and new players we had a chance to meet a lot of those Marshall Falk, you know, Eric Dickerson, those kind of people were there. Oh, so awesome. it, was, it was okay. I mean, you know, like I say, you know, the, the draft is crapshoot. So when you're sitting there and you're saying, okay, this is the, the person that uh, uh, has been drafted or whatever it is, you know, you're very hopeful. But I think in, in this particular instance, um, you've mortgaged the franchise on this young man. And so it better be ripe. And that's the one thing. And you're not going to know until he starts to play because no matter what you do, uh, you know, observing somebody in training camp or observing them in OTAs or even rookie camp is not going to help you get a judgment as to whether or not he can play football. And you would hope that this, then you pray and you have faith in the people that are making the selection that they're correct. But, you know, I always say, the draft, you never know what you're going to get. You never know. I mean, do you like the fact that they sort of went full bore and making sure that they put weapons that are as young as Jared Goff around him Well, with the, a lot of the picks? The situation that they had was that they didn't they, – they, they, they drafted a tight end, and they also drafted, a, I think, another wide receiver in the picks that were left. Okay, mm-hmm. and then they had uh, their, their 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 wide receivers that they had before, and so and with Tavon Austin, and so that they're looking for is 
this tight end that they got, this Higby guy out of South Carolina, you know, they're improving in that area, and they got rid of uh, uh, Jerry Cook. And so you've got Britt, you've got uh, Tavon Austin, you've got Brian Quick. You know, they're hoping that these guys will develop. And, um, you know, the Rams' receiving core is considered very poor, but sometimes, like I said before, it's the responsibility of the quarterback to get him the football. And so you really can't tell sometimes whether it's the quarterback's fault or the receiver's fault. The one thing I can say, if a ball hits you in the hands, you got to catch it. And then I can easily blame the receiver. As far as an overthrow or, you know, a close one where they might have dropped it or caught it, I can't really tell whether or not somebody would say who's in the caliber of Des Bryant, would he have caught it? I don't know. I mean, you know, it's all on the individual. But what, what they have is, a, you know, basically a young receiving core, not really an older one. They did bring in two more wide receivers on Monday, so or Tuesday. Yeah, Tuesday they brought in two more wide receivers from free agency, rookie free agents. So hopefully maybe one of those guys will crack the, uh, uh, you know, the, the starting lineup. I heard Farrell Cooper is really good, but um, you know, I, I can't really tell. Like I say, when you're out at the training camp and you're watching, you're seeing receivers run their seven on seven. There's not much coverage there. So. Yeah, it's uh, much different than when they actually start playing the games and everything. You gotta play uh, the game. <laughs> did uh, I mean? Do you really feel like? It is going to be all about Todd Gurley this season, handing him the ball as much as possible, and trying to make Goff not have to do too much. I think what you will see from the Rams is what has been reported out here through the press, that it appears that Jeff Fisher is going to start Keenum. And then he's going to slowly move uh uh, Goff into the starting role. So I don't anticipate that Goff will be the starter. What I anticipate is Keenum will be the starter until the Rams start to lose a few games or something like that, and then he'll make the switch. And I think they're, that, that he's hesitant to just throw him right in there. You'll see him get playing time. There's no question about it during preseason. And possibly, depending on how the ebb and flow of a football game goes in the beginning of the year, you might see him a little sooner rather than later. But that's what the read is out here. The read from the from the press is that there, that Keenum is the starter and that Goff will, will eventually take over the role. That's clear, okay? But they don't want to rush anything. And he's got to learn the playbook. He's got to learn a lot of things that are adjustments that he has to make here in, in, in being in professional football. And they don't want him to lose his confidence, obviously, if they just throw him in there and he just starts throwing the ball in the wrong places. So they want to bring him along slowly. So I really, this is my, my position is I believe this will be true, that the Rams will not start him, but eventually they will. Now, let's assume Keenum goes 20, you know, wins 10 games. Why would they need to put in golf if Keenum's won 10 games? You understand what I'm saying? So they kind of bring him along to see where they're going. Yeah, I mean, redshirting oh. a year is never... Never a bad thing, if that's what happens. Agreed. But my thinking on it is that, yes, Keenum was, had a pretty good record when he was at starting quarterback last year. I can buy into this for the first couple of games. But if the Rams start off slow, then the fans and people like myself are going to say, it's time to put him in. And so you're going to rely heavily on Todd Gurley, as you suggested in the beginning. So, so, so what you'll see is the Rams relying on that running game, not putting that much pressure on the quarterback to make the key throws. But there, obviously there are going to be games when defenses are going to have eight in the box, and you're going to have a tough time because you're going to, they're going to shut down Gurley. And so you're going to have to have somebody that can throw the football, and that's going to be the key for the Rams. They're hoping they're in third and short, not third and long. So, you know, we'll see how it plays itself out, but it's certainly the expectations are that this is going to be a, a offense that focuses itself on Todd Gurley and that when golf comes in, it'll be a slow, maturating process by which he becomes a starting quarterback, gains confidence, and maybe they can open up the game a little bit more as he plays more. I mean, the defense lost some 
some key talent that's been there for a bit. Uh, they're having to sort of recover from that. I mean, how do you think that they're faring so far with... And I mean, what is it going to be expected out of them after they're kind of losing a Janoris Jenkins, not having a Larry Nidus anymore? Well, again, this is this is something where you move Alex Ogletree from the outside to the inside. You got Mark Barron playing an outside for his safety, et cetera. My my thinking is that in in this particular instance, we'll we'll wait and see. There's a little bit more speed that you're going to get out of Alex Ogletree. We're looking forward to the E.J. Gaines. E.J. Gaines is the guy that's coming off a foot injury that didn't play at all last year, and he played really well when he was in there two years ago. And they also have Marcus Robertson replacing Jenkins on that side. So I believe those two will rotate. You've got Trumaine Johnson, I think, is a really good corner, and he really played well last year and improved his stock in the NFL. He was, he was very good. I think the question becomes what's going to happen back there at safety. If T.J. McDonald, you know, is got into an incident out here, he could be gone for four games. So, you know, they're really are depleted back there at the safety, but we'll see. I mean, they didn't go out in the free agent market and get one, and I, and I didn't anticipate this happening to T.J. because it happened after most of the good ones got signed. So we'll see. Hopefully we're crossing our fingers. You know, the first key to a good pass defense, is a rush, and I don't think there's any question in anyone's mind how good they can be with that rush. I mean, William Hayes is going to have to step up, step it up because he's replacing um, Long uh, on that other on that other defensive end. But you've got the best defensive tackle in the league in in Aaron Donald. So, you know, in talking with uh, Greg Williams, who's the coordinator of the Rams, he loves to put pressure on quarterbacks. He loves to come with blitzes. He loves to do all those things. And that's going to be the key. You got to stop them up front first. If you if you can't get the pass off, you don't have to worry about the corners and the safeties. I mean, now looking into the division and and the schedule and everything here for the Rams. I mean, they've the schedule is pretty rough. I mean, they've they've got some tough teams all across the board that they've got to play uh, in some succession here. I mean, how many games do you think the the Rams are going to win here? Well, that, as I've told you before, I always come into the season saying we're going to go 16 and 0, and if we don't, it's not a success. So that's how I start things. Now, obviously, <laughs> that's not reality, but it's doable. Now, in in, rea- in the reality sense of trying to be a pro proscostinator or somebody trying to project out into the future. I think every game is different, so every game you come into, it has different machinations that flow from the last game. You don't want, like, you know, if you start off the year and you have an Achilles heel that last year you didn't have penalties, this year you do. Last year you had turnovers, this year you don't. You know, maybe you didn't have turnovers last year and you have a lot this year. A lot of things come into play that, that start to evolve during the season. As I look at it now, I mean, the division is really tight. I mean, we have one of the best divisions in the league. Clearly, Arizona's on top of that chart, okay, and Seattle's right up there. Seattle can be knocked off of that perch, you know, because they did lose a key player in Marshawn Lynch. And there are some, some feelings that maybe they're, they're on their way down and not on their way up again. And then you have the 49ers who have really just fallen way off. So... When you have the Rams, you look. I look at their schedule and I say, we need to make a run here. We can't be seven and nine, eight and eight. All of the stuff that they were doing previously the last few years, which is just buying time. I mean, eight and eight, seven and nine. It doesn't get us into the playoffs. And given that they have the third toughest schedule again, because they keep being right at that 500 mark. They're going to play good teams, and they're going to play a lot of good teams and a lot of bad teams. And given how tough the division is, the Rams need to come out of this nine and seven. And I said this before that if Goff is the answer and Keenum can get them going here offensively with a new offensive coordinator that we've got now for a full year, nine and seven is not unreasonable. Nor is it not making a run at the playoffs, making a run to get the wild card. Because I do think the Rams can do that, and I do think it's important to start the year off really strong. So 
because they got some tough games coming up. I mean, they've got some, some – I mean, their first three out of four games are on the road. I mean, that's that's tough enough as it is. You're going to play New York. You're going to have to play Miami. You're going to play Carolina. You're going to play some really good teams, plus you're playing the Cardinals and the Seattle Seahawks twice. And the 49ers, as bad as they are, it's a rivalry game. It doesn't matter. Throw out the records. Anything's possible. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, your first three out of four division games, your last three all-division games, I mean, that's rough in itself. And then, you know, the rest of what you got there, I mean, how, I mean, how just is it that you guys have, out of your first, was it one, two, three, four, five, six, eight games, or seven games plus the bye, two of those games are at home. I mean, Talk just... to the schedule makers in the NFL. I, I, I'm really, you know, I can't answer to that. I mean, I know one of those games I think is a London game where the Rams are a home team. So, right. you know, you're, you're looking at, you know, the fact that they may be home and that would count as a home game, but they're really having to fly all the way over there to London. Now, they did that last year, so they're kind of used to it, and I think that may give them a little bit of an edge going in as to what they need to do to get ready for that game. But um, that's something that, you know, that the Rams are going to have to get used to. I mean, something we, we have to just not. I'll tell you this, the NFL packages for that game, because uh, I inquired about that, they probably run me about $6,000 per ticket. So that's quite a hefty sum to go see your football team in a home game. <laughs> in the West. Yeah, really. <laughs> uh, I mean, does that even include, like, the travel and everything? No, it doesn't. But I, I'm including it in travel, okay? Ah, uh, okay, okay. Okay, the flight and everything. They don't pay for the flight. Now, I yeah. asked about charter flights, and you would assume that maybe there would be a charter flight of fans that would fly over there, and they said right. that they don't provide that but that we'd have to check with the Rams as the season progressed as to whether or not they were going to do something like that. Now, the tickets themselves are not expensive, but it's accommodations and it's the flight, and then you've got to have food, so you know all of that. Right. So I figure it'd probably run me about $6,000 per person. So, I mean, where – so exactly where – you said 9 and 7. I where do you – where do you see them as far as in the division? Where do you where do you see the division going one through four? I see the division being right now. If you ask me, I mean, yeah, there's a lot of intangibles here. Right, but right. Really, Arizona is the pick. Everybody likes them. Okay, if Carson Palmer can stay healthy the whole year, they're okay. They'll be number one. That's what everyone says. Um, I think the Rams could come in second or third, and it can be interchangeable with Seattle or the Rams, depending on a lot of different intangibles, again, coming into play. And then I think everyone would pick the 49ers to finish in the bottom. Yeah, I had the uh, 49ers uh, person on earlier, and he was very realistic about, man, they're just going to probably have a bad year. So. Well, it, we get a lot, you know, we as Ram fans love to see the 49ers, you know, blowing up. But there are a lot of problems up there. I mean, as far as the ownership and its relationship with the fans, that's a big problem right now. Right. And uh, what they've done with the team since Jim Harbaugh left is there's like hardly anyone left. So all of that talent that they had before isn't there. Um you know, you have an unknown quantity in, in Kelly as the uh, head coach. And if his record in Philadelphia is anything, you know, is going to is, is reminiscent or whatever is going to be in the 49erville, they just don't have that personnel that he had in Philadelphia. So, you know, it's, it's, to me it's problematic. They have a real issue at quarterback right now, and you never know. I mean, yeah, you, this is it for uh, uh, Kaepernick, and he's either going to make it or he ain't. I mean, this is going to be his last last hurrah. As far as Gabbard is concerned, there isn't anybody in the league that doesn't consider him to be a terrible quarterback. But, you know, a coach, a coach can make the difference. You know, if Kelly can get it done, you can get it done. You just don't see anything on any other side of the ball when it comes to the 49ers. Besides Kelly at the head coach, what do you got? What, what do they have that's in the marquee name? And that's the problem with the franchise because the ownership 
has shown an inclination to get rid of everybody that was there under the Harbaugh regime. Right. So you as a Rams fan, I mean, there's still talk about possibly a team joining over at the at the uh, Rams stadium. Do you want to see that happen, or do you just want it to be? I, I'm guessing I know the answer to this, but do you do you have a problem if say the Chargers are or well, Raiders I, wind up over there? It's a very interesting question because we as really diehards, we all get together and we talk about this. And as far as the diehards are concerned, they do not want to share the stadium with anybody. That's it. We don't want them. Okay. I'm kind of mixed on it. I'm neutral. Um, but I've been asked if I'm told on television or somebody asked me to always say that we don't want them. Okay. I'm <laughs> neutral to the extent that I understand that there are problems in, in San Diego and that there are problems in Oakland in getting a stadium. And so those teams are going to want to move. Now, the reality is a deal was cut. The Rams said they could come. Now, if the Rams had said no, that would be one thing. But they did say that either, you know, the option goes to the Chargers first and then, then it goes to the Raiders. And if, if they're willing to take up that offer, I believe they're going to move in. Of the two teams, I can tell you the Chargers have no fan base out here. We don't – not only do they not have a fan base out here, because they only played here for one year in the 19, 1960, uh, 1960 was when they did, uh, they don't have a fan base, nobody likes them. They just don't. The Raiders have played here before, so there is some small portion of a fan base here that would, wouldn't mind the Raiders coming here. But the reality is if San Diego can't get the deal done in San Diego, they're going to pick up the option and come to the stadium in, in, in Inglewood. I would assume that's what they would do. The Raiders' option is to move to Las Vegas, which, uh, which, which, which is available to them, and they're working that out. But that's the, those are the two things. Of those, three, of those two teams, it's clearly the odds-on one that everyone would like to see. If they have to take a team, and I'm saying have to take one in there, it would be the Raiders. So you kind of already told me, sort of realistic base case scenario was nine and seven. What is? What do you think is the worst that they'll do? Worst? Yeah. yeah. I know. I know you I don't want it's, because now you're asking me about my team losing football games. I, unacceptable. I, unacceptable. Five and eleven would be terrible. Six and ten would be terrible. I mean, eight and eight is. That's not cutting it with me either, but I, I would say 5-11 and 11 is absolutely horrible because that's barely winning the games in the division. And if you don't beat the 49ers, uh-uh, that's not acceptable. You don't beat the Seattle Seahawks, not acceptable. You've got to beat these guys at least once. Right. You can't beat some team like, you know, out of your division, like, you know, who's, who's, who's terrible. 5-11 no, I mean, and 11 would be an absolute disaster out here for this club. How uh, how long do you think? Let's say they don't particularly do. Well, how, how long do you think Jeff Fisher has? Not very long. I mean, that's the key to the Fisher Snead regime out here. Is first of all, assuming we do get Jared Goff at some point during the season, did he pan out? Did 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 the selection was it worth mortgaging the franchise for? The second thing, if he is, then obviously they're going to win and Jeff Fisher gets his job back or keeps his job. On the other hand, if, if he's got the potential but the Rams continue to flounder for some reason, then the, it's going to get blamed on the coach because the coach has got the players and everyone sees the talent, but it's the coaching that's holding him back. So from, from, from being a really good team, they make bad calls or bad decisions or whatever it might be that loses the football game. So there would be a lot of pressure for Jeff, you know, being in his last year and he's looking to get an extension. Is he may not get it? I mean, they may let him go, but um, clearly they want him around because of the relocation problems, and he's used to it. So he has a certain knowledge about being able to walk this team through some of these things, the issues that come up. You know, I mean, he had a great statement when he came out here for the first Rams players meeting. You know, get a driver's license in California. You need a driver's license. It takes a while to get one. 
see. And many people would think, well, you're just driving around in California and when you're coming from Missouri. That would be, you know, no problem. You have a, a driver's license here. No, not if your residence is in California. You've got to have a California driver's license. It's those little things that he's aware of, having gone through it before, that helps the Rams make a, a you know, as seamless as possible going through this process. And I can understand the Rams wanting to keep them for that reason, but the pressure from the fans is if the talent is there, then the coach has got to be blamed for it, not winning. All right. Andrew, you've answered all of our questions here. I want to say thank you again for helping us out. Anytime you want to talk about Rams, I'm more than available. I will make it be available. They're my favorite team. They're going to be my team forever, and we're so happy out here this honeymoon that we're having with the los angeles rams is incredible the fan support from from people that remember them and to the new generation of ram fans that are going to come along as angelinos it's really exciting and i can't wait for a week from this friday or saturday the rams first game against the dallas cowboys it ain't going to be a dry eye in the house oh my cowboys gotta go deal with this so <laughs> But, uh, yeah, I mean, best of luck to the Rams, hoping that they can uh, be successful in this first season, you know, because it's really good for the league and everything. It is. It's important it's that Los Angeles be good, as well as the fact that you can always call me back the, the week before the Rams are in the Super Bowl, and I can give you the rundown on why we'll win. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, for your sake, I'll, I'll uh, be hoping that happens. But, uh all right, Andrew. You have a good night, All right, night have too. a good one. Bye-bye. All right. All right, there's Andrew Kulik talking L.A. Rams. Uh, obviously optimistic about his team here. I mean, he he's another one just like Chet that kind of thought that the Seahawks are kind of sort of be – won't be the perennial big team that we're, that we're used to seeing. Do you really see the Rams as possibly – contending for that second spot at all? I mean, I mean, for the second spot, maybe. I mean, they weren't that far off last year. What were they, two games off? One game? Uh, I guess they finished seven and nine, excuse me, so they fell off a little bit. But, I mean, they were in contention for that second spot, I think, for a little bit. Uh, I can't see it right now, to be honest, though. I don't know how you feel, Gary, but I mean, with all of the, the turmoil that this team's going on, with the quarterbacks, with Keenum or Goff, and I mean, he's even saying they're going to probably switch partway through the season and moving to L.A. and and all of the the changes that they're going to have to go through there. I think this is a rebuild season for them, too. And other than Todd Gurley, I don't like any of their offensive weapons. Uh, Kenny Britt is nothing to me. Tavon Austin is a great speed guy, uh, but I don't think he's going to lead your receiving core. So whoever the quarterback is, I don't see a ton of talent around him. The defense is solid, and that's what's going to keep them in games. And even though I don't think they really have the best shot of making the postseason, I think the defense is going to make them interesting all season long. What do you think? I totally agree with you on the defense part because I think they're going to be the key to keep this team around in games. I really feel like that offense has potential. Uh, Now, I'm not saying they're not going to be – uh, you know, game busters. And I'm just saying I think they have potential to be really good. Now, the quarterback situation is such a question mark that right now as we sit, you can't guarantee anything with it. And with such a young quarterback, no matter what your opinion on how good this guy is, Goff is a guy that has brains, he's got some ability, but, you know, like anybody – First year in, it's a learning curve, and he's got to figure things out. This is a different speed than he ever faced in college. And I I don't imagine this guy is going to come out burning uh, the house down. I think that really what's going to happen is it's going to take some time for him to get his feet under him. Uh, It's going to take some time for this offense to work and and gel together because of that. I mean, the quarterback is a central position. Um but I look at that defense of holding them in games, keeping them around, and no matter what does happen, you know, even if they have to start a different quarterback, if Goff's not completely ready to go, this team is going to be growing. They're going to be learning together. I think they're a little bit ahead uh, of the curve when it comes to maybe uh, another team in this division. But I just I have a hard time believing in them. I think that, you know, 
if you're a Rams fan, you've got a lot of hope. But that's about all you have right now uh, because there's it's too much to too much growing that has to happen with this team. Yeah, and I mean that's the kind of thing you just said. Growing a lot of this team is going to be doing that. I mean, you still got young receivers everywhere. You got even though you have a veteran in Lance Kendricks, you're, you're still going to have a Tyler Higby or someone else uh, on the other end, tied in wise. Whether you start Jared Goff day one or whether you bring him in, Case Keenum is not a proven commodity either. I know Gary, that you know that's Gary's number one guy, whatever, but Definitely. he's not. Uh, He's not a guy that you're going, oh, my gosh, I'm totally relying my team on Case Keenum either. So whoever you got at quarterback, it's a it's a process. And so it is going to be on that defense to try to keep them in things and get them involved and say, OK, we're we're going to be we're, we're going to be the workhorses for this team and just make it as easy as possible for them to keep getting the ball, keep uh getting opportunities to try to score. And don't forget, you got Todd Gurley there, and I think that's going to be a lot of the offenses. Can we get Todd Gurley getting or going as much as we did last year? Our team's going to come in with that mindset of, okay, eight in the box, somebody that's not Todd Gurley going to beat us. And how are you going to cope with that? And are the Rams going to be able to to have – a way to get out, get out of that when, when they're presented with that issue because it's going to be an issue. There's going to be teams, and we already outlined that this this whole division's got to play. A, they've got a nasty schedule. All these teams they got to play are, you know, it, it's going to be hard sometimes to find wins for these guys. So yeah, They all have to play the Jets. It's very difficult. Yeah, they all got to play the Jets. Um, <laughs> you know, they... Uh, they all got to play, uh, I think it's, what, the NFC South? Yeah, the NFC and, South and the, a- the AFC East are the, are the yeah, two divisions and, and that I they have to play. It's tough. I, I don't want to play any, any of those teams. I mean, Tampa Bay's only getting better. I mean, uh, the, mm-hmm. we, we know what the Panthers are. The Saints are are always the Saints. They're going to be involved, and Atlanta is, is also in that conversation of they're Atlanta, and they're going to be formidable, so... Man, it's hard for me to say the Rams. I think seven and nine could could be a issue for them to get to there, just because of the schedule. You know. Yeah, I mean, and you know what? Because of that schedule, that may be a good year for them. Uh, you know, I, I totally understand Andrew though. He does not want to get the seven and nine again. Yeah, uh, and at it, least it's an even, eight and eight. Yeah, and the schedule itself, as he talked about, does not help them that much they do have a lot of road games early on and if the plan is to start keenum uh you're looking at a rough start and a quick trigger to go to golf and then you know it's a complete wild card we know how how rookie quarterbacks usually do in the nfl with the, the, the few occasions of some some great seasons but for the most part they really struggle and if they start out, you know, one and three, one and four, and they pull that trigger quickly, uh, the record could be down there in the 49ers range. Mm-hmm. For sure. So we got one more here, and this one was kind of cheating because, you know, SLP is a guy that's been on this podcast since it's been called so many different things. Uh, he's been down with us pretty much since almost day one, and I kind of had him – sort of do some card and take some Cardinals questions, but he is a Seahawks guy. Uh, but I wanted to have Carly on because, you know, uh, it's not, we, it's not like we've had a plethora of Seahawks, uh, riders at, at last word. So I wanted to give her an opportunity to, to represent. So he kind of does half Seahawks and, and part Cardinals here. Um, I'm going to play this. It's only like about like 12 minutes. Then we'll talk about the Cardinals and then do our final standings and get out of here. So here we go. Uh, SLP talking Cardinals to NCR. Hello, and I'm here with Sean Lewis Phillipson. Been on the podcast so many times. <laughs> uh, thank you for joining us uh, here again, SLP. What's going on, man? Thank you, Sean. Well, I've just been busy doing yard work all day, so... Glad I can make a time to spend some minutes with you talking NFL football. 
Yeah. Uh, so, you know, SLP is obviously, you know, uh, you, we've had him on here talking Seahawks. He's a Seahawks fan. Uh, but he's going to cover for us a little bit, too, because we uh, – this is one of the – People that I, I don't have, I don't uh, have a fan on call of uh, uh, the Cardinals at all. They was on a Cardinals, so he's going to kind of do uh, a little bit of both here. And you already heard uh, Carly uh, do, you know, do pretty well covering the the Seahawks for us already. So um, we'll, we'll do a little bit of mix and match here. Uh, you know, for the for the Cardinals, I mean, they they got really close last year. They got blown out by uh, the Panthers unexpectedly in the playoffs, and they come in, reload again, uh, don't lose a whole lot, are able to, they, they pick up uh, a big guy in Chandler Jones, I mean, do you think that that's the piece they were missing? Probably, I mean, you can look at it in so many different ways, you brought up the fact, uh, Sean, that Carolina um, actually, yeah, they beat the Cardinals, and the Cardinals were so close to making an unprecedented Super Bowl win uh, or uh, appearance. But with him, I think he could fit into the uh, into the group quite well. I don't think there's any question about that. You know, for the Seahawks, it's uh, it's a year where again they were also <laughs> beat by the the Panthers, and yeah, uh, they they did lose some some sort of key guys uh, defensively, you know, losing a Russell Okun. Yep. Still sort of having the, the biggest issue for the, for the Seahawks last year was sort of protecting uh, Russell Wilson. Do you think with what they got now, I mean, do you still see that as an issue going into this season? It might be during the first couple of weeks, give it, maybe two weeks at least just to see how the offense clicked, especially with the offensive line. Uh, currently on the depth chart for Seattle, Gary Gillum, one of the left tackles there, Golowitzki, um, Britt under center, Ifredo and Webb on the right side. It will be interesting to see how all five of the offensive line heat Russell Wilson in the pocket because you, you mentioned it up that, Russell Wilson needs to get in the pocket long enough for him to throw the ball out and find his receivers. Yeah, I mean, and they signed Doug Baldwin to that extension. Yep. So, you know, the receivers are going to come back uh, all happy with the, with their money. But one guy that is a question mark, and Carly was saying there's even reports that uh, Jimmy Graham – May his injury may be very career threatening. I mean, are you are yeah. you worried about Jimmy Graham? Am I worried about Jimmy Graham? No. <laughs> it's hard for me to say that. I mean, given the fact he's twenty nine, he's on the rise aging wise, but if he can produce like he was with the Saints, but again he slowed down with the, the knee injury, hamstring or whatever it would be. I think we'll see Jimmy Graham improve significant stats, not be the 10 touchdown kind of guy, um, maybe around five to eight range. He'll, he'll fit in the offensive scheme a lot more um, than he did last year in his limited time playing. I'm not worried on him. So you think he's going to be ready for the season and everything? I think he will be. He'll have like any player getting injured. And I think you can even adapt to, I think your team is the Dallas Cowboys, even though I'm staying off of that. Um, you can understand that coming from an injury, you could be rusty. Yeah, I mean, very true. It, sometimes yeah. those injuries take some time to to heal and for you to – not everybody can be like Adrian Peterson and just bust out no, no. after a, a torn ACL and do great, you know. Yeah, and Graham with the Parteller tendon injury – those are a lot harder to come by um, to to re to rehab and get back into tip top shape. I'm not worried on Graham, um, although I feel like last year again I feel like he could have brought more to the offense than just playing um, slot receiver and being a extra back for the Seahawks offensive line. I mean, so looking at this division, you'd still imagine that 
these teams that we're talking about here are the top two teams yes. uh, coming into this year. I mean, where do you see the, the separation at here? Well, if I had to go on this point, I still think it's the O-line. I still think Seattle's O-line is suspect just because um, arguably – I think Zona's offensive line held on up a little bit better with Carson Palmer um, throwing the football, which most people never thought he would succeed to this day. Uh, that's my only little minor flaw that I give the advantage uh, Arizona over Seattle um, in that. Both defenses, though, look pretty strong, um, considering Cardinals re-signed Matthew to a five-year extension. So given that, he'll still be on the D-line uh, 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 playing safety. So there's no question about that. Uh, Sherman is still doing his work um, at the corner. So, again, everything seems to be even, evenly matched between those two except the offensive line. So, I mean, if you I – mean, looking at the – I mean, it's, it's, it's obviously seems like a sort of two-horse race. But yes, there is this feeling – uh, from talking to some of the other guys, the, you know, of the the fans of the other teams and analysts, they're saying that there's a possibility for maybe a Seahawks drop off, and perhaps the the Rams sort of are battling with them for that second spot. Do you believe that? I'll believe it when I see it. That's kind of my motto, Sean. But uh, in the case that Saint, not St. Louis, but if Los Angeles does make a little rise, which they could. Um, and if, if they can get Seattle napping, then they could overtake that second spot in the NFC West uh, division. But realistically, right now, um, I don't see it happen. I still see Arizona and Seattle being the top two teams in the NFC West. Uh, so, you know, you got to make that, that prediction. Where do you see those final standings, one through four? Well... I'm still putting Arizona top of the standings like they were last year. I think it, once once they all gel and click during the first part of the midseason, the second half should be just fine as long as Carlson Palmer stays healthy. I mean, that goes for a lot of players. They need to stay healthy to perform. Um, I don't think Seattle will regress, like I said, last offseason that they would and they did. Um, they'll, they will improve by maybe a game or two win. Um, St. Louis, they will be an up-and-coming team in the NFC West with their rookie quarterback. San Fran's just a total massacre, and I'm not even going to comment on those. They, they'll be bottom feeders to me in the West. I'd be totally shocked if all four teams were as good as they are, but they're not, except for two. <laughs> Zone in uh, Seattle. I mean, talk to me about... David Johnson coming on the scene here yes. and just absolutely exploding for the Cardinals. I mean, do you think that that's the, a big key factor for the Cardinals and, and being able to repeat what they did last season, not having to rely so much on Palmer, just Johnson right. really being a guy you can. Yeah. Uh, David Johnson had a terrific year uh, coming in off. He in currently on ESPN's death chart, he's listed as a third string running back. So given the credit, Arizona has multiple weapons in the backfield uh, to use in case if one man goes down. Johnson played well, eight touchdowns, 581 yards, 125 carries. Um, I might see a drop-off in that just because we'll see how Ellington, Chris Johnson, if those two also play a a, a factor um, in Arizona's offense. I mean, so... You uh, you have Arizona winning. Yes, I do. Uh, do you have Seattle getting the uh, getting a wild card? They will get a wild card slot. Yes, Seattle will. So, how far do you see the those two teams uh, <laughs> going playoff wise? <laughs> well, you're putting me on the spot as you should be. <laughs> um, you know, I could actually see um, both teams, um, if not Carolina, I would love to see Seattle make it to at least the NFC Championship. Um, and it, I, 
it all depends on if they get home field advantage as well, man. Um, Zona's really hard to play in, such as Seattle. Um, I'm going to actually make a statement right here, right now. As much as I love the Seahawks, i got to be real with them. They will be eliminated in the NFC Championship game by either Carolina or Arizona. One of those two teams will knock off the Seahawks. All right. Like like the big prediction there. Uh, so give me a – I mean, obviously it looks like best-case scenario for the Cardinals is uh, Super Bowl. And yes. it seems like that for the Seahawks as well. Yes. Give me a worst-case scenario for both teams. What do you think the worst that they're going to do? Uh, for Seattle, it they would, to me, again, this year's not a regression year for them. They'll play just fine. Um, what would be disappointing for me is if Seattle gets eliminated in the wild-card game. Um just because I'm sure later on in the year they could ride up the momentum and win four or five games in a row and then lose to whomever the wild card team is. Um, Arizona, the worst possible thing for them is two things. One, again, I really hate to bring up the injuries, but Carson Palmer's health, because we saw a couple years ago when Palmer wasn't active um, late part of the year and they had Drew Stanton, I believe, playing quarterback. He was dreadful. Just an absolute horrible player in the team. Um, The injury to Palmer and two, nothing short of Super Bowl. They shown last year they can be for real, but they lost to a better team in Carolina. Um, Arizona would be my dark horse to make it to the Super Bowl. Anything disappointing, a Super Bowl would be bad for them because they have all the tools, they have all the weapons they can contend with in the NFC division. And in the conference. All right, SOP, you answered all of our questions here. I want to thank you for helping us out and coming on. Thank you, Sean. Anytime. And I hope you get some rest after all that yard work, man. <laughs> I'm trying to, man. Thank you. All right. That was uh, SOP talking Cardinals and Seahawks. Um, I mean, the Cardinals, we, we kind of all said it. I think every person that's been on here has said that the Cardinals should be the top of the heap. I mean, is that where you guys are going to? Yeah, absolutely. I think so. I think, you know, their window is closing themselves, but I I think they're at the top of their game with Carson Palmer and Larry Fitzgerald and all of them. I do like David Johnson, you know, as a running back. So uh, I think they're going to be very tough to beat. That offense is great. The defense continues to improve. Uh, so I think they're the top of the NFC West, and everyone's chasing them. Yeah, I think there's, you know, some factors here that you got to look at, and that's the fact that this defense is, you know, gradually and, and just over time getting better and better. And I think last year, sure, they had some – uh, you know, I, I mean, I just, I, I almost want to say unlucky moments, especially when it came to the playoffs. But besides that, they were an excellent team during the regular season. They were a team that no one wanted to face uh, because all their phases of their game were great. Uh, so, I mean, I, I think this, what they're getting this year too. I think they're going to come into this year just like they kind of left off last year and just be ready to, and there'll be a team that a lot of, of other coaches will be saying, how are we going to beat them? Uh, they're good in all three phases. we got to figure out a way to, to you know, find a chink in their armor. And There's not a whole lot of them. If they can stay healthy, this is one of the most dangerous teams in the mm-hmm. entire conference, if you ask me. I mean, this, sure, in the West, you know, they're the most dangerous. But in the conference, I think they're up there. Yeah, with them, let's just say I'm waiting for week eight when they go to Carolina. Uh, that game is going to be a blast. Oh, yeah. I agree. It's going to be uh, not only an offensive showdown, but a defensive showdown as well. It's going to be mm-hmm. pretty uh, equal. Yeah, I mean, this... Uh, yeah. So let's go ahead and do our final standings here, guys. I think we kind of already have said them throughout talking here, but everybody's got Arizona first. Yeah, I would put Arizona... 
Let's go a conservative twelve and four. Uh, I'll give Seattle a nine and seven, and then you go St. Louis probably a six and ten, and Forty ers We'll go five and eleven. I, I yeah, think they can see St. Louis. Ah, gee, we, we were just talking about that while we were listening to <laughs> Los Angeles. Excuse me. Uh, I'll put a quarter in the jar. Don't worry. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Los Angeles six and ten. San Francisco five and eleven. Uh, you know, I, I'm pretty close to Randy on this. Uh, I, I think Arizona is definitely going to be a, a difficult team to beat. Uh, I've got them going 12 and four. I mean, I, I think that they're going to be one of those teams. People are like, "Wow, you know how how did anyone beat them?" Uh, I think it's going to come down to maybe them losing four games because they lost them by a field goal or something crazy happened in the game. Uh, I look at you know. Uh, I really think that Seattle's an interesting team. I think that once again they can find ways to win. I think Randy hit it on the head nine and seven. I think they're going to kind of fall short in some games that they normally would win. Normally they would overcome, and I think this year there's some games they're not going to be able to overcome. They'll be nine and seven. I look at the L.A. Rams, another interesting team. Uh, I think I'll have to put them at five and eleven. I just think that they're still not going to be able to reach the goals that they want to reach. I think they're going to you know, uh, have some struggles when it comes to getting their offense ready to go by the beginning of this year. I think the San Francisco 49ers are a four and 12. Uh, I think that they're a team that once again, they're growing, but they're going to steal a game or two for somebody who really is going to be shocked. So I've got, uh, let's see. I've got the Cardinals going 12 and four here as well. Um, I'll say Seattle, Nine and seven. I think the Rams give them more win. I think they'll get uh, eight and eight, and the the Forty Nineers will get four and twelve. So there is uh, my standings. And all right, guys, we made it through another division. So next week we'll be doing the NFC South, and uh, yeah. Then just marching along here again, we'll we'll get to be able to talk about uh, the Hall of Fame game and uh, all the other, some other preseason games that will have happened uh, by then. So and of course we'll be doing uh, what is it? Uh, is it the Mac? We're we doing the Mac this I think week that's what on we said. on uh, and we still got that Bouton West one hanging around so. That one, we may be doing a double, who knows. But yeah, for sure the Mac on yep, the Mac. on Friday. All right. Well, or on, on the Monday show. But uh, all right. Uh, until then, everybody. See you later.